Um, hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a heroin addict. Jessica. Um, my clean date is 229 of 16. Um, I have several home groups. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor, and I have several sponsees. Um, so this is super stressful. Um, so my um, story, I'm going to try to give like a brief recap of like my growing up and everything and then how it is today um so i grew up pretty normal childhood um my parents are still together today they've been together for 38 years um my mom was a homemaker and my dad had his own business um and i remember a lot in my childhood i spent a lot of time like trying to um make my parents happy to show them that I was like the best kid ever um, and that I was a lot better than my sister. Um, and I basically, I didn't use at all. I didn't drink. Um, I didn't party all through high school. Um, dance team was super important to me and we had a really strict coach. Um, and so we had a curfew. I never really snuck out. I left all of that stuff to my sister who was younger than me. Um, and I basically spent my growing up years um, just trying to um, prove that I was um, a good kid and that I could make my parents happy. And that was what made me happy, was making them happy. Um, so after high school, um, I went to college at Oregon State. Um, that was my first real experience with drinking. Um, I joined a sorority. Um, we drank every single night um, to the point of blackout drunk, and that wasn't, um, that wasn't unusual. Everyone in my sorority did that. Um, and it was kind of funny to us, like where we would wake up the next day and, you know, what had happened and let me know who I slept with. And, you know, we called it the walk of fame when we walked home the next morning. Um, and it was what everyone did. Um, so after, um, after my freshman year, I had stayed in contact with um, one of my kind of acquaintance slash boyfriends from high school, um, and he had joined the Navy, and we decided that we would get married, and it was a marriage of convenience and military benefits. Um, he came up to Oregon, he was stationed in California, and we got married at the courthouse with um, two of my sorority sisters um, watching our union, and he was there for, I think, two days, and then he went back down to California. Um, and probably two weeks after we had gotten married, um, I found out that one of my boyfriends from high school had committed suicide. And he was super close to our family, although I hadn't been close to him in the last six months before he passed away. Um, and I reached out to my husband at the time and told him what I was going through. And he did not understand why I was upset about losing this person um, and told me not to talk to him about it. He didn't want to hear about another guy in my life. So um, I did kind of what I had always done and I um, reached out to another one of my male friends and I spoke to him about what had happened and um, felt comfort in that situation and I ended up sleeping with him and cheating on my husband at the time. Um, and I ended up telling Brandon about the situation and he told me um, that I needed to move to California because he didn't trust me up here anymore. So I moved down to California and that lasted a whole 10 or so days um, before we ended up getting really drunk one night and in a blackout rage he tried to kill me. Um, and so I had called my 
mom at two o'clock in the morning told her what had happened. He had um, gotten taken away by the military police. Um, and my mom flew down to California that next day, swooped me up, grabbed all my stuff, and we went back up to Oregon. Um, probably a month or so later, my parents helped me file for an annulment, um, and we never talked about it again. It was like, that's done, we're moving on, um, and my parents drove me back to Oregon State, and I went back to school like nothing happened. Um, I ended up in another relationship with a man um, who was my best friend at the time, um, and we lived a together in a house with a bunch of roommates. Um, my relationships looking back with men have always been super codependent and um, abusive in one way or another. Um, this relationship was really emotionally abusive. Um, when we were alone together, um, I was his girlfriend. But if we were out at a party, we weren't together. And um, he was pretty clear about that. Um, but we lived together. We were always in the same room. Basically, we shared the same computer. Um, and I started thinking that he must be cheating on me. So I would go on the computer and check his emails. And at the time, this is um, 2002, and instant messenger was really big. Um, <laughs> and. I would get on there and I would pretend to be him and I would talk to other girls that I had heard him say their name and I would pretend to be him and try to get information out of these girls um, to see what my boyfriend, my boyfriend was really doing. Um, and I did that on several occasions. Um, a little while after that, I mean, every time that I would, every time I would go on the computer and do this, and I would find out information, I'd go back to him. It'd be a big fight. I'd say, you know, this girl told me you did this with her, and um, we'd get into a big altercation. And I would always tell him myself every time I collected some type of information. Um, so probably a month or two after this started, I ended up getting pregnant. Um, I went to the health services at Oregon State and was told I needed to have my appendix removed. Um, so I went to Meridian Park Hospital with my mom to get my appendix removed and found out I was pregnant and had an eptopic pregnancy. Um, so my, in that period of time that I was at the hospital getting checked out, my tube had ruptured and I had to have emergency surgery. So I had my tube removed, and then I was in the hospital alone um, and trying to reach my boyfriend at the time to tell him what had happened. Um, and he thought I was being dramatic or making things up, and so he wouldn't answer my call, and his mom hung up on me, and um, I ended up leaving the hospital the next day, going back to school at Oregon State, like I had always done. Um, and not hearing from my boyfriend at all, you know, never talking about that situation and um, never getting any closure on our relationship. And then probably two weeks later, um, I got a knock on my door and it was two police officers that asked me a bunch of questions about these conversations I had had online. Um, and I ended up getting arrested for nine felony counts um, of identity theft, computer crime, and coercion. Um, and at the time, in the early 2000s, like, it was like a big deal. Everyone was talking about identity theft and all of this. So it was like they were going to teach me a lesson. And I'm just this little girl that's, you know, doesn't believe her boyfriend. Um, so I ended up doing two, two years of probation. I pled guilty to three felonies. Um, and went about my life again, you know, without any kind of discussion or resolution for anything. I just went back to what I knew, and that was school. Um, so I completed probation successfully. I never had any issues. Um, 
I ended up getting those felonies expunged after the three years um, and got a really good job at Oregon State. Um, I went into a graduate school program at Oregon State after that. Um, never really drank that entire time, never had any issues, and also never um, became friends or developed any kind of relationship with anyone at Oregon State. Um, I'm a fairly private person, so I don't tell people really anything about my personal life. So um, building a connection with someone that isn't like a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, I didn't know how to do that. You know, I knew how to have super codependent, enmeshed relationship with men, but I didn't know how to ever get close to a woman. Um, so I graduated from my master's degree at Oregon State, and um, I had the felonies on my record for about a year, had some trouble getting a job and all of that, um, but still had the support of my family. Um, I ended up finding an employer that didn't do a background check and um, started working for them. Um, I went back to school again um, for accounting for a new position I had taken and um, met a new guy. And I was, we were both in relationships at the time, um, which is also kind of my pattern is moving from one relationship to the next and no breaks in between. Um, we broke up with our significant others and started dating each other. And um, he was an addict in every sense of the word. He could get, atta he could get addicted to anything, any substance, any um, TV series, I mean, anything. Um, and I had never come across someone before like that. Um, and we would party together and hang out and everything was fine for quite a while um, until we started introducing other drugs into our relationship. Um, we started um, using meth and he had been using for several years previous to that and every time it would get really bad and we would have these huge fights, cops would get called, I would throw all of his stuff out in the street. I mean I was like the trashy neighbor in this really nice little neighborhood um, and I never talked to any of my neighbors, <laughs> you know, I was super private about everything until it wasn't private and everything was on Front Street. Um, and we did this in our relationship for five or six years of this on again, off again. And he eventually went to treatment um, and we broke up for probably 60 days or so when he was in treatment. Um, while he was in treatment, um, he became friends with a few heroin addicts in treatment. He had tried heroin before. Um, it's not something that I had ever been around or anything. Um, he got out of treatment, went into sober living, and we rekindled our relationship and started using heroin together. Um, and it's hard to explain like how easy that is for me to do, but being in a codependent relationship like that, I just wanted to fit in with whatever my boyfriend or was doing at the time. And so um, even going to other ways of using heroin, it wasn't hard for me. You know, it, it wasn't even a thought in my head that, oh, you could die from something like this. It was like, I see my boyfriend's using and his friends and they're all still alive and looks like a good time, which it really, looking back, it doesn't look like a good time, but, um, and so that was easy for me to start doing. Um, so we uh, used together for probably a year after that. Um, we both had really good jobs and I was able to maintain my job and um, for quite a while with really no one knowing otherwise. Uh, we ended up breaking up and I stayed in contact with um, one of our drug dealers who kind of chose me in the relationship over my boyfriend. Um, and it was 
it made sense to me to start selling and support my habit that way versus having to use all of my income from my job. So um, I started selling to support my habit uh, and did that for probably six months. And I loved that life and I loved selling because I had people that finally needed me and wanted me around and I didn't make the connection at that time that it was for you know the drugs that that didn't matter like I would get calls all hours of the night that people that needed me to be somewhere at a certain time and and I would be there I was needed I was wanted um, and I would sit for you know hours in the car and have these like therapy sessions with people that were buying from me and um, that felt good to me you know um so eventually Gabe and I broke up and um I started dating someone that I was selling to at the time and he moved in super quick into my house um and he became very controlling over every aspect of my life I was working from home quite often And that's how I was able to hide all of this from my employer for so long uh, is, you know, if I didn't want to go in, you know, I had this important teleconference I had and I had to go to this meeting in Portland and no one could really check up on what I was actually doing for work. So I was just home and um, my boyfriend was so controlling at the time that eventually got to where I couldn't even check emails for work because he wanted to know who I was emailing, why I had to be on a teleconference, um, what that email was about, and was it talking about him? I mean, it was just crazy. So eventually I just kind of stopped working at all. Um, And we had decided to go on a trip to Uh, Nevada to see his grandmother Um, and I had access to my company credit cards and I used my company credit cards to basically fund this $10,000 road trip Um, and I like looking back like I can see why I did that in so many ways but it was there was there was no thought to consequences of something like that you know i thought i was smart enough that i could hide all of those funds i could make up you know a conference that i was supposed to attend and that's why i had to drive on this road trip and and i knew in my head i could hide all of that um so after we got back from nevada um we were home for a few days and tried to return the rental car. Um, It was a bright yellow, brand new Camaro was the rental car. (laughs) And I decided it was smart that Devin drive the rental car to return it and I would follow him. Well, you're in a Camaro and he decided to speed. And he didn't have a license at the time, so we ended up getting pulled over. Um, The he used a fake ID to try to get out of a speeding ticket, which they found out it wasn't him. Um, so he went to jail. Um, they came to talk to me in my car, even though I wasn't you know, being pulled over or anything, and found a rig in my car. Um, I was able, I looked normal enough at the time and was able to cover up all of my marks on my arms and make an excuse that that was you know, for giving my grandma insulin, and they let me go. Um, two days later, Devin got out of jail and went to check in with his PO and they rearrested him because he should have served an entire sanction for being arrested and getting more charges. So he went back to jail. He developed an abscess and was in the work center at the time. So, um, I had gone to pick him up. Um, to take him to a doctor's appointment, dropped him back off at the work center, and the second time I picked him up from the work center, um, he had obviously been up for several days in the work center. Like, I know how easy it is to get drugs in there, and he was out of his mind. Um, So he refused 
to go back to jail. Uh, I talked him down enough with one of his friends that I got him back to my house. And at this time, my mom got a text on her phone because she did not like Devin at all. She had signed up for a Vine alert for him if he were to get arrested or released. Um, and my mom got a Vine alert that he had escaped from Marion County. And in my mom's head, he was this like horrible person, horrible gun-toting, you know, drug addict, and he had like taken his her daughter hostage. Um, so my mom had called his PO and um, talked to the police, told them where I lived, and the police surrounded my house for two days, um, watching for Devin to leave at some point. Um, we ended up, I ended up getting fired on a Friday from my employer. Um, and on the, the next day, the Saturday after that, um, Devin had decided we should leave the house. We were going to go on a little overnight trip. Um, and he would turn himself in on Sunday. And we got maybe a half a mile, a mile away from my house, surrounded, pulled out of the car at gunpoint, um, and both of us got arrested. Um, I had um, drugs in the car. He had a stolen gun in the car um, and packaging, that kind of stuff, materials. Um, so I immediately said lawyer, because that's what I had kind of heard everyone say, like, don't talk to the cops at all, say lawyer. So that's what I did. Um, Devin ended up talking to the police and saying that everything in the car was mine. Um, I didn't have a criminal record at the time, so I also said everything was mine in the car, knowing that I would get less time than he would. So I ended up getting, I ended up pleading guilty to three different felonies, um, taking drug court as my um, punishment. Um, and I got released after 26 days in jail. Immediately, I walked from jail to someone's house that I knew used. Um, and my problem at that point was not necessarily staying away from the drugs. It was staying away from the lifestyle. And all I wanted to do was sell another sack. And so I went over there trying to hook him up with something. And um, for the next six days, that's what I did. And I tried to make enough money to bail my boyfriend out of jail. And on the sixth day, my mom came to stay with me for the night. She spent, I completely crashed out. I had been running for six days, so I just went to sleep. And my mom spent 12 hours searching my hotel room trying to find something because she knew I was on drugs. And my aunt came, and my, my aunt thinks that she's like a CSI because she's watched way too many shows. So she like instantly went into the hotel room, went into the bathroom, pulled out the um, Kleenex dispenser, and found meth. So they thought it was heroin. They thought I was back on heroin again. Um, and called the police. And before the police came, they tried to plead with me um, and try to get me to get some kind of help or to admit that I had a problem, and I still could not do that. Um, I thought I could manage it myself. Um, so I started to get ready, um, get some clothes on, and then two police officers were at my hotel room, and I went back to jail. Um, and my original sentence for drug court is um, basically don't get in trouble again or I go to prison. And so I thought I was going to prison at that time. Um, I told my mom and my aunt goodbye, and I said, visit me at Coffee Creek. You know, that I thought that was the end of it, really. Um, so I went back to jail for a sanction for violating my probation at the time. Um, and drug court chose to accept me still into drug court, um, even though I had gotten an additional charge, um, as long as I went to treatment. 
So I agreed basically to get out of jail to go to treatment. I didn't think I needed treatment. I was just going to go. I was going to check their little boxes, um, do what I needed to do, and get out and be fine. Um, I went to treatment on a Friday. Uh, my boyfriend had uh, gotten a loan from our drug dealer to, get, to bail himself out of jail. And he visited me the following day on the Saturday while I was in treatment. Um, and the following Wednesday, we got into a huge fight. Um, he said that I had been sleeping with his best friend and um, like a lot of like just trying to control me still, you know, and keep me scared of him even when I was in treatment. Um, so I went in on a Friday. He visited me on Saturday. We got into a fight on Wednesday and he overdosed and died on Friday on the following Friday. Um, and one of my roommates in treatment said to me, um, that sometimes she said someone had told her this in her past that sometimes people need to die so another person can live. And, um, although that's really hard still to accept, like that, I feel like propelled me to actually have like my first spiritual awakening in treatment to where like I knew that something greater than myself was working. You know, I knew that if I stayed in that relationship that I would die eventually, you know, easily. Um, so in treatment, it was the first time where I actually developed relationships with women, um, where I became friends with women that um, I told everything to. You know, I did my um, first first step in treatment. Um, I was completely honest and said everything. I mean, every I admitted everything to you know, anyone that would listen in my home group. Um, I was in treatment for 26 days. Um, and while I was in treatment, I heard a little bit about Oxford House. Um, I decided to interview at an Oxford House, and I got a pass to go and do that in treatment. Um, the first Oxford House that I went to, I was voted into, which I think is kind of abnormal, it seems like. Um, and I absolutely ended up where I was supposed to be. Um, I'm not going to cry. Me <laughs> <laughs> um, And the, the women in my Oxford house accepted me for who I truly was. Um, and I was still, even after all that time in jail and treatment, I still could not let go of certain criminal behaviors, and I was still hanging out with the wrong people for probably the first month that I was living in Oxford. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't using, but I was still doing all the criminal behaviors. And the women that I lived with helped me gain a conscience or uncover my conscience that had always been there. Um, and taught me how to really live without doing all that stuff. You know, those, the people that I um, still had hung out with and um, that those people didn't really love me and didn't have my best interest at heart, that the ladies in my house really did. Um, and I don't remember, like, if it was when I started working my steps or when I started working with a sponsor, but just coming to this realization that I didn't have to live that way anymore and that wasn't who I truly was at all. Um, so I guess, I don't know, in the last several months, um, 
I finished working my steps with my sponsor. Um, her and I are super close. She drives me a little crazy sometimes, but I think that's her job. Um, I started sponsoring women, and I never thought that people were like me. You know, with me, like, using so late in life, I felt like I never felt like someone would actually connect with me on that level until I started sponsoring women. And I have a sponsee that told me my exact story back to me. And it's just, it's crazy, you know, where I used to, like, clarify, well, I'm different because, you know, I went to college, and that makes me different. No, that doesn't make me different. There's, I mean, all of us have gone through different experiences in our life, and we have this underlying, you know, issue that ties us all together. Um, and so one thing in... Uh, treatment that we used to read all the time um, were the promises and I I don't hear these read that often and I feel like they're really important because um, after working through my steps I really feel like a lot of the promises have come to um, fruition in my life so I'm going to read those um, if we're painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant, extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Um, and I remember reading that in treatment. We would read that every time that someone graduated treatment um, and thinking, like, I hope that that happens for me sometime. And I really feel like, although not all of those promises have come true, like, I still have economic insecurity. I think everyone does probably forever. <laughs> um, but a majority of those have come true, and it's a result of working this program. It's a result of um, doing the steps, having a sponsor, and being committed to my recovery. So that's all I got. Thank you guys for coming. So from here, um, it's a discussion meeting. Please limit your sharing to three to five minutes so others have a chance to speak. And the meeting is now open for discussion. Do you have the book? <coughs>